Thank everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about my perspective on big data in the enterprise and kind of what the current state of it is, uh, why it is that way, and then guess what? This is a sponsored session, so the answer happens to be our product. So we'll get into the end, kind of what, what we do at CASC and how we feel that that addresses uh, the holes in big data and the ecosystem that we're in. I've got about 40 minutes, and I really wanted to get to a demo, so I'm going to try to get to the content really quick so that we can get to the demo and have some time for a couple questions. So we're all at Strata Hadoop World, so we don't need to do a lot of selling of the value of big data, but I thought I would bring in a little bit of stuff at the beginning. Um, obviously, big data with Hadoop as this kind of center spoke around it, driven by digitization of everything, social media, mobile, IoT, all this kinds of stuff. That's really the oil going into these gears. But this is really being driven from business needs, right? We live in the age of the customer. Um, more and more companies need to be data-driven, drive a data-driven type of culture. And digital disruption is disrupting virtually every single industry. At the same time, IT is becoming more and more powerful because of low-cost commodity hardware, the move to the cloud, the adoption and proliferation of open source infrastructure technologies. And there's also some new skills and new people. There's data scientists, there's machine learning, there's predictive analytics. This isn't just about batch reporting. This isn't just about creating some singular dashboard for executives. This is actually now big data is about closing the loop. It's about actually predicting stuff. It's about actually driving recommendations to your customer. And so the way we see it, you know, you're getting People driving market differentiation, better customer service, better customer engagement, optimizing their businesses, reducing risk, all these kinds of classical things. And today, businesses are really driving value out of big data. So while I think there's a lot broken with big data in the enterprise, there's also tons of opportunity. Healthcare, there's tons and tons of cost savings that are beginning to uh, take effect because of big data. Um, location data is just uh, absolute goldmine of revenue, opportunity, um, data, services, and analytics. And retailers, anyone with a consumer-oriented business using data to drive margins, um, increase operating margins, drive better customer experiences. But these are a couple quotes from Gartner. Um, through 2017, 60% of big data projects will fail to go beyond piloting and experimentation and will be abandoned. That's a lot of projects. That's a lot of money and time. At the same time, you still have increasing investment. Virtually all major enterprises are now investing inside of big data, investing in big data. But as of the latest survey of Gartner, only 15% of the customers that they talk to basically have projects in production. And that's up 1% from a year earlier. So I think there's a little bit of a gap here in terms of there's tremendous opportunity, there's tremendous innovation, there's tremendous demand from the business around big data. But at the same time, from the IT side, it's, it's actually really, really hard to deliver on all this potential. So why is it? Well, number one, if you just look at what we think of as kind of this big data chasm, tons of data is being generated. Lots of data is even being stored. A tiny, tiny percentage of that is actually available for analytics, and an even smaller percentage of it is actually being used for analytics, and a tiny fraction is actually being operationalized. And so there's a lot of idle bits sitting around on disks everywhere, and not necessarily a lot of business value being driven from it. So why? I'm going to go through a few different points of kind of why we think big data has these different challenges, um, why these challenges are really inherent to the space itself and propose some solutions around how we can get around it. So number one, Hadoop is not just Hadoop. We all know that. Today, this is over 47 different projects. There's six, seven, eight different distros, depending on how you want to um, count it. And so when you're saying, I want a Hadoop project, I want a big data project, just wrapping your arms around what that even means when I buy CDH or HDP, what that even comes with, that's kind of a research project in and of itself. So there's an inherent complexity because of the diversity of technology here. Second, there's a really big, large talent gap. 
that talent gap has to do with data scientists and analysts. It also has to do with data engineers, developers, operations, all of these types of people. In the world of relational databases and data warehousing, we had a lot of nice discrete roles, a nice left to right process about how the data moved in, how it was ETL'd, how it was loaded, how it was analyzed. And Hadoop has really thrown all of that out. And so you need new skills. And it takes time for people to develop these skills. So if you have these skills, it's awesome because you can make a ton of money in the market right now. But if you're a customer and you're trying to hire these people, it's very expensive, it's very hard to find them, it's very hard to retain them. Big data integration is a really big challenge. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Partially, we're dealing with new types of data, new varieties, velocities, volumes, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you also are trying to look at your mainframes, you're trying to look at your data warehouses, you're trying to look at third-party data sources. There's all these different things going into it. And ultimately, one of the challenges of big data, and we'll talk more about this, is Hadoop lets you punt a lot of the stuff, kick the can down the road. I can take my mainframe data warehouse, my unstructured social media data, and dump it into Hadoop. But it's not actually available for analytics yet. It's just a bunch of files sitting on a file system. I think the big data integration challenge is really a major, major impediment to the adoption proliferation of, of Hadoop and big data. It's also a lot of security and governance challenges. Three years ago, I think we would say there's not really security, there's not really encryption. That stuff's kind of been solved, or at least it's being addressed pretty directly by the Hadoop distributions and other companies. But multi-tenancy, still virtually nowhere to be found. Um, performance optimization, SLA management and monitoring, backup, disaster recovery. There are elements of these things, but we're nowhere near where traditional data systems are. We're still years and years and years behind. At the same time, you have some really interesting dynamics in the market. Number one, you have divergence between the distributions. So when it comes to security and governance, you're starting to see very, very strong divergence. Completely different solutions, for example, from Hortonworks and from Cloudera, right? Around how you do governance, metadata management, lineage, even security enforcement. Not only are they different tools, different projects, they have totally different models. So that's really complicated for a lot of different people. At the same time, Hadoop itself, as I alluded to before, kind of inherently impedes data governance. If I'm just putting a bunch of files with a bunch of unknown structure into a file system, well, that maybe made my ingestion a lot easier, but it's really poor for governance. How am I supposed to understand that this field maps from this field from this source and all that? And so the schema on read, the unstructured nature of what Hadoop allows you to do, really presents a lot of security and governance challenges inherently. Now, even if you address all these types of issues and you're able to, to get through it, there's still further problems downstream. So number one, in response to a lot of these challenges, you've seen more and more point solutions. More and more vendors come in to tackle security, to tackle governance, to tackle ingest, integration, um, all of those types of specific challenges. But Point solutions, number one, drive integration of those solutions. So you still have a kind of an integration problem. And second of all, it's rising a new type of shadow IT. I may be able to sit on my desktop and use a tool to take some raw, dirty XML file and turn it into something nice and pretty, but how do I operationalize that work? How do I hand that off to IT to actually use in production? And so even though there are some really cool solutions out there in the market, it's leading to some downstream problems. Like I've been saying, schema on read is really where you get the data swamp from, right? If I don't have any system tracking my data, if I don't know what my data looks like, who did it, all that kind of stuff, I end up with a swamp. Someone goes and does an ls slash in HGFS, and there's a bunch of stuff in there. I don't know who did it, I don't know what it is, there's no annotations, there's no metadata, right? Hadoop doesn't have that out of the box, you have to do it. A lot of the low-level nature of the ecosystem drives a lot of manual coding. Manual coding creates tons and tons of problems. Number one, though, this is really a productivity challenge. It's productivity from the, the aspect of the developer who's writing the code, but it's also everybody downstream of that. It's the new developer who comes in after that person leaves. There's a whole bunch of different challenges around having to write manual code to do things in Hadoop. 
So like, why is this, and how do we fix it? So my background is I was a software engineer at Facebook before I started Cask. And you know, when we first started Cask, actually, we didn't have that many data integration capabilities. And what I always say is, that's because at Facebook, I never said the word data integration. Data integration was simply not a thing at Facebook. Now, why is that? Well, Facebook and a lot of internet companies basically have internal platforms. They've built platform services, they've built shared services, they've built all these different capabilities that are managed and run by other teams that you just tap into. I think the clearest example of this is something Facebook had called Facebook's Data Freeway. This was built on Scribe, which was like a predecessor to, to Kafka. And there was this little library and a little function called slog, scribe log. And so you could, in PHP, in Python, in Java, in C++, there was an slog library. I imported one, one library, and I had a little function called slog. So anywhere in any code I wrote inside of Facebook's infrastructure, I could just write slog and put my log line, right, with a, with a topic, basically. Now when I deployed it, that automatically tied up into all of the Hadoop infrastructure, right? I didn't have to understand what it was, I didn't have to do anything, I had to provision Hadoop, I didn't have to do, do anything. My data just showed up for me inside of the warehouse. The next thing they did was they created something called HivePal, Hive Pal, basically a UI on top of Hive. So all of these things that automatically landed were automatically turned into Hive tables. So as a developer, I import slog, I write my slog functions, and I can just start running my Hive queries against all that data. Right? So this is kind of like data lakes before data lakes were a thing. And so when you come out of that into the enterprise, well, this stuff doesn't exist, number one. And number two, Facebook is all greenfields. There's no legacy, there's no mainframe, right? Data warehousing was something off to the side, used for the business. Really, it was, it was a very different type of thing. And so, number one, you had these internal platforms built, and number two, you didn't have the same types of requirements. And so if you're not Facebook or Google, well, what do you do? I think, you know, one other point that I would make about this is if you look at, you know, Facebook had a lot of contributions to Hadoop, before that, it was all Yahoo, and really started from Google and the papers that they wrote. And if you look at kind of where all this technology came from, and if you look at the fact that the companies using this had all of this built around it, it becomes a little more clear about why it is so hard. Because the people who wrote the technology and invented it had all this stuff around it to make it usable. But when you go into open source, that's all gone. And so Hadoop doesn't come from IBM, HP, Oracle, and Microsoft. Like when they ship products, they build it for enterprises, for enterprise requirements. But when Yahoo and Google and Facebook build stuff, right, they build it to solve a technical problem for themselves. I was part of a startup, I had a seven person startup, and we wrote like half of the HBase code base over a year's time. This little tiny seven person startup. And so where innovation comes from, you don't know. And at that startup, were we thinking about enterprise security and governance? Absolutely not, right? It was purely technical challenges we were solving. When Berkeley Amp Lab releases Spark, it had no security in it, basically, at the beginning, right? That got added after it was released as open source. These things start out for technical reasons, not for market opportunities, not to solve specific enterprise requirements. They start really to solve technical problems. And so if you think back to that massive adoption of all these different projects, these are technologies that solve technical problems. They're not solutions for enterprises. And that's really how I see this big gap, and that's why I started Cask. So today, what's happening a lot is there's plenty of these big data landscape slides that you can see out there. And there's tons of tools, there's tons of projects, there's tons of products. What we believe the answer is, is something we call a unified integration platform. So you can think about this as the next generation of data integration, the next generation of application servers and application management. And it's an end-to-end -end platform. So we've been building this for over five years now. Um, it's been in production at large companies like Salesforce.com for three years. Um, as a company, we've raised $34 million. We're based just down the road in, in Palo Alto. And our product is called CDAP, the Cask Data Application Platform. This is 100% open source. You can go to cask.co and download it. You can go to github.com slash caskdata 
and check it out. And this is a platform for distributed data-driven applications. It combines what would typically be thought of as application development, application management, with data integration and data management. In the world of big data, these things are really, really coming together. And oftentimes, almost all the time, it's the same team. It's no longer separate organizations, separate teams, separate skill sets. The same big data team is responsible for delivering solutions on top of this infrastructure stack. Sign up kind of the core elements of what this platform is, and I'll go more into detail here. Number one, data integration. Ingest, wrangling, data pipelines, workflow, metadata, all those types of typical data integration capabilities. App Dev, think about large distributed application server. I want to create streaming pipelines. I want to create RESTful services to serve it up. Um, there's a really a blurred line here between what's a data pipeline and what's an application. And CDAP allows you to do both of these types of things together. Security and governance, really, really important. What CDAP does is really provides, number one, end-to-end -end security, and number two, kind of automated tracking. So there's an audit, audit log, there's lineage, there's metadata capture. The user doesn't have to do anything. It happens automatically. Self-service, a really, really, really important aspect of what we do. The data integration, app dev, security and governance is a really IT side things. These are really platform team things. But more and more and more, a big data platform team doesn't live in a silo, doesn't live in a, in a bubble. Their goal is to enable and empower line of business users, enable and empower data scientists, business analysts, people like that. And so being able to expose self-service user interfaces on top of this platform is a very, very critical aspect of what CDAP allows big data teams to do in their enterprise. Lastly, CDAP is portable and built for production. So things that you develop through you know, WYSIWYG, visual type of editors, you can hit a button, it becomes a production pipeline. So you can manage it, monitor it, look at its SLAs, scale it, integrate it to third-party systems, all that kind of stuff. And at the same time, you have portability. So CDAP works in every distro, cloud, on-prem, about eight versions of each one. And so virtually any Hadoop environment that you have, CDAP will work on top of it, and everything you've built on CDAP will run in that environment. So, I'm gonna move through this stuff really quick, but basically talk a little bit about lifecycle and how CDAP really helps end to end in terms of what you need to do. So from a data integration standpoint, I need to ingest data, real-time batch, unstructured, structured, whatever it is. I need to make that data available for exploration. Ad hoc SQL, BI and analytics, data science, things like that. Once I know what I wanna know, once I wanna be able to provide structure, or apply machine learning and stuff, I need to actually process this data. Scheduled pipelines, all that kind of stuff and then I want to serve it up. That could be through RESTful endpoints, SQL APIs, ODBC drivers, Python libraries, whatever it is that I need to do to serve it up to the end user. CDAP supports real-time and batch, reliability and scalability, and it's very simple and built for self-service, especially around data integration capabilities. AppDev is a lot about lifecycle. So I have a development phase where I want to rapidly build stuff, and so CDAP works on your laptop in an emulated mode, very lightweight, allows you to, and I'll demo that, allows you to um, get started on your laptop. Everything you build can be run in a test mode, and it can be triggered with CI. So I might create some pipeline that I built with the editor, I might have extended it with some code, I might have a RESTful service that I wrote. That can all be packaged up into a single file. I can test it on my laptop, I can test it with my CI system, I can deploy it to production. So. Any of the apps will work in any of the environments, and there's a whole bunch of horizontal scalability um, capabilities for the apps and the data. Again, this works in real time and batch. There's three primary modes of CDAP. There's a memory mode, which is what you would use for unit testing and CI. There's a local mode, which I'll show you a demo of, and there's distributed mode, which I'll also show a quick demo of. Security and governance. CDAP automatically stores and captures metadata about your data. So anything from the source system, anything that can be inferred around what the jobs and processes are actually doing, and whatever you decide to put in it. And so you can also add your own metadata, and that metadata can be inherited and stuff like that. 
all the data that CDAP knows about can be discovered. So you can browse it, search it, all that kind of stuff. All accesses are audited. All pipelines automatically track lineage. And so for every single data set that you have, you can see its provenance, you can see its peers, you can see upstream, downstream. And CDAP also analyzes usage. So what are the most popular data sets? Is this data set actually being used by a bunch of applications, queried by a bunch of users, or was it created like six months ago and nobody's looked at it since? So understanding how your data is being used really, really helps in, in terms of discovery and understanding the quality of that data. From a core capability standpoint, CDAP supports encryption, authentication, authorization, all that good stuff. And it supports and integrates with traditional and existing security systems. So if you're using Sentry or you're using Ranger or you have LDAP or Active Directory or you can write your own custom provider, basically CDAP will integrate with whatever your security provider is and map that into your Hadoop environment. One of the big things CDAP does, we have an IT side platform with line of business usability on top, is really try to bridge the gap between the different personas here. So you have the development team, you have the operations team, you have your data scientists and analysts, and you have your line of business and product teams. And today there's a lot of different vendors selling a lot of different solutions to different roles here. Um, but without a consistent set of tools, it's very hard for IT to be that data enabler for the business. You know, what's cool about big data, I think, is IT can actually have a tremendous high value role and position within the enterprise. You are the data stewards, you are the data enablers, and if you can actually drive that self-service, access any data at any time with security and governance included, that's like the holy grail, and can make a huge difference to the business. And so that's a demand on IT, and I think it's something that's really hard to deliver without years of time or a, a platform like CDAP. We like to think of this as self-service with guardrails, right? So rather than being on the shadow IT side of things where your power users use power tools, they get stuff done themselves on their own desktops, there's the completely centralized and IT controlled thing where you have static reports, things are slow, things take forever, changes take a really long time. We think of this self-service with guardrails is something in the middle that allows you to be agile. You want to provide self-service usage. You want to provide the usability so that not everything that a business user or a data scientist needs requires an email or a ticket or a phone call to be made. Um, but at the same time, you really want that work to be transferable into production. You really want things that a developer builds to be exposed and usable by the end user. And so, and at the same time, you want to make sure that everything your users are doing is being audited, is being tracked, and so you can actually verify what's happening. A couple of little qualitative things about the platform, and we're going to wrap up here, we're going to move to the demo. CDAP is kind of a new version of write once, run anywhere. Right? So you can run on-premise in any distro. You can run in hybrid situations where you have different distros, different clouds, on-prem, and you can run in pure cloud. And another thing I like to talk about is this is also an integrate once and run anything type of system. And so if you think about downstream of developers, right? and Spark, I think, is the clearest example of, of how this has happened in the Hadoop ecosystem, Hadoop MapReduce was very well established operationalized from an ops security and governance kind of standpoint, right? So the operations team who's handed something from development, put this in in production, monitor it, manage it, set alerts, integrate it into our existing systems of how we monitor and manage things. So that happened, right? And then all of a sudden the developers found Spark. And wow, this is way easier. This is way more powerful. And things were developed and handed over to operations. And for the first year or so of Spark, a lot of our customers had the same experience. The operations team wanted nothing to do with Spark, right? Why? It was more immature, didn't have the same oper operational um, controls, security was really lacking initially. You know, all the things they had done around the scripts to manage MapReduce jobs, integrating all of those counters and all of the 
um, logs into their existing systems had to be redone again. So while the developer's life got way easier, operations and everybody downstream, it got a lot harder. Over time, that's been fixed. But ultimately, this is going to happen again, right? And so as the next big thing comes out, as it's Flink or Apex or whatever the next great thing is, CDAP is going to integrate with that, allow developers to use those APIs, but allow operations, security, governance, management to be the same. So you manage them as CDAP programs, as we call them, and it's really agnostic to the specific runtime. So lastly, the way I kind of think about big data versus traditional data and where we are and where we need to be, I kind of wish I had a picture of like a formal hoodie here, because that's where I kind of think we need to get to. Traditional data warehousing and BI is highly structured. It's formalized, it's established, right? Very consistent. Today, and historically, big data and analytics has been highly agile, right? Highly experimental. It's more like the hoodie crowd. And I think really what we need is a bit of bringing these two worlds together and to figure out how you go from one side to the other. There's value in both of these different things, except if everything is experimental, ad hoc, and on your desktop, it's really hard to drive meaningful, massive amounts of business value from it. And so I think big data bliss really has to address this kind of bimodal agility with delivery. You want agility, you want self-service, you want usability, but at the same time you have to deliver stuff, things need to go into production, things have to be operationalized. So when the experimental becomes enterprise, I think that's when we're gonna start to see more and more uh, value come from this. So CDAP, we really think about trying to bridge this gap. Self-service with guardrails, providing that line of business usability with the IT flexibility, and taking things like security, metadata, lineage, and giving it for free. So you don't have to think about it all the time. So with that, I'm gonna jump into a demo. And I have 12 minutes. So, just to prove it's empty, I'm gonna delete everything. So what I'm running here is called CDAP Standalone. So you can go to cast.co, download this tarball, and it's basically a little lightweight, single process version of the platform. Functionally, it's exactly the same as a full blown thousand node cluster, just runs in threads, and it runs on your local file system instead of HDFS and Yarn and all those types of systems. So I'll run it here, and I'll get the UI. And it's empty. So I'm gonna do two different use cases here. So the first one I'm gonna do is I've got a CSV file with some customer data in it. And what I wanna do is load it into Hadoop. Maybe I wanna put it into like an HBase table and some Parquet files and run a SQL query against that, All right? The next use case after that I'm gonna do is how we deal with a use case like data warehouse offloading. Have some data sitting in a Teza. I wanna move it into Kudu, do some analytics on top of Kudu, put it, push it back out into Natiza. So this first one, we're gonna start with this new capability we just added in 4.1 called our data preparation. This is like a Wrangler. So what I do is I create a little workspace for my data. I've got my customer CSV data here. Oops, sorry. I forgot to upload it. All right, so upload that data. <coughs> so let me zoom in a little bit. So you can see here, body, bunch of CSV files, or CSV lines. The top line here has got my schema in it, so I'm gonna just copy that out so I can grab it. And this tool is based on a notion called directives. So basically, it's like a little DSL. Um, in 4.2, our next release, everything is done through the UI. In 4.1, you basically have the power mode where you type in the little DSL. One of the things that's cool about this is adding a new directive is very, very, very simple. 
Um, it's the kind of thing we do on site at customers in like 20 minutes, right? Oh, I need a special little parser for this date type or this format or whatever it is. So I'll show you what we're going to do here. So it's all type ahead based. And what I'm going to do first is parse this as CSV. It also supports JSON, XML, and some you know, very particular formats like HL7 data for healthcare and things like that. So I'm going to parse CSV body, comma, and skip empty lines. I'm going to drop the body. So now you see I've kind of exploded it by commas. Uh, I want to um, set the column names to that. So now I have column names here. I still have that first line up there where it's showing the actual header. So I want to delete that. There's a few different ways I can do it. Um, but I like this one. So I can filter rows. I can add values, a whole bunch of different things to it. This is like filter row if true, and I can write Java conditionals here. So like I can say if the ID is equal to ID, I don't want that row. And it'll apply right there. So here we have some initially parsed data. Over here you can see where our directives are. These are the four things that we've done. We can look at the columns over here and understand. Looks at things like inferred types, the number of null values, all that kind of classic prep stuff. If we go into like state and zip, you'll see that it's picking these things up as zip codes. You can also look at what the output schema is. So here's what the output schema is going to be. We input body, and we output ID, first, last, email, all that kind of stuff. Um, let's do um, one more thing. So let's say I'm interested in adding another column that has the domain name of their email address, because I want to be able to group by domain names, understand where people are coming from. So there's a thing called split email, and I just give it the email. And then over on the right, I now have email account and email domain. I want to drop email account. I want to rename email domain to just domain. And that's good. So at this point, there's a few different things I could do. I could take my directives, and I could export them. So I can then hand them to somebody else and import them. Um, or let's say my goal is actually to operationalize this pipeline. So now I want to be able to take a database of this or a much larger CSV file and write it into HBase and Hadoop. So I click Add Pipeline. I'm going to do it in batch. And basically, that Wrangler thing now became just this list of directives with this defined output schema. And so now I'm basically in this canvas view where I can drag and drop building my kind of ingest ETL pipelines. I'll pull from a file. Configuring the file, first I give it a reference name. A reference name is how CDAP's going to treat it. So when it audits it, when it creates lineage graphs around it, what do we want to call this thing? So I'm going to call it my customer CSV file. And I threw in a temp for simplicity. Actually, you know what? I'll show another feature. You can also configure these pipelines with runtime parameters, right? So I'm going to configure this pipeline to basically take a runtime argument called file name. So now this pipeline takes any customer CSV file and will wrangle it for you. And I'll show you how that works at runtime. I'll go back into Wrangler. Now I have my input here. Um, I'm going to add one more directive up here where I drop the offset because I don't want the offset to be carried through. Um, one of the features of Wrangler is error records. So I want to capture errors. If for some reason an event can't be parsed, where does it go and how do I count it? So right now I'm setting, if there's five errored events, just stop the pipeline and fail it. But I can also collect those events. So I put my error collector down here. And I see offset body. Here's the different fields that are going to get populated for the errors. And this is going to generate what my output schema is. So I'm going to get an error message, an error code, an error stage, along with the original offset and body from the events. And we will sync that. I think I have five minutes left, so I'm going to go fast. Let's put that into some Avro files. We'll call this uh, customer errors. We're going to write to an HBase table. 
and we'll write to some Parquet files as well. So we'll do HBase so that we can get some random access to our customers, and we'll write Parquet so we can do more efficient SQL queries. So here in our HBase, we'll just write customer table. And you see it already has the schema in here. I just need to give it an ID. And Parquet, customer Parquet. And again, gives us our schema. Customer import, we'll call it. So at this point, I basically built this pipeline. Before I do anything, this is what's behind the scenes. So what you've done visually is actually just represented as a JSON object. So I can export that, give it to somebody else, import it, and you can see things like the file path is parameterized inside of the configuration, right? Uh, hitting preview allows you to run this without actually deploying it, without actually creating all those tables and stuff, but I'm going to skip that in, uh, to save some time. And then I'm going to run this. So when I run it, it tells me I have to give it a file name. So I'm going to give it this temp and start it up. All right, so while this is running, I'm going to show Cask Market. So Cask Market is something that's publicly available, something that we ship. Um, it's available right out there on the internet, and it's all open source. You can also run your own Cask Market inside your enterprise. So it's a way of when I create a new plugin or a new pipeline or some new Wrangler directives or whatever, I can publish it into here, and somebody else can click it and add it to their instance of CDAP. And so you can have lots of clusters. People can be on their own laptops, but everything tying back to that central market. So data warehouse offloading, something that we're doing more and more. And so through the market, you can do stuff like, all right, I want to download and install in a Teza driver. So I already downloaded it, so I'm going to push it here. Now I have a Teza driver installed. I wanted to get the Kudu source and sync. Since that's open source, you don't have to download it separately. That's just packaged directly in the market. So you hit a button, and now that's deployed. So now I've got my Natiza driver. I've got my Kudu sources and sync set up. And I'm going to now look at this um, example pipeline that takes a full dump from a Natiza table and creates a new Kudu table and writes it to that. So I'll click Create. We can call it Natiza to Kudu. Finish. And now we can customize that. So I'm back in the canvas, and I've got my Natiza to Kudu. Here's my database. So as of now, everything's parameterized. Put your user, put your password, here's the connection string, here's the SQL query, all that good stuff. Looks like every other JDBC connection. Kudu is very similar. Here's my Kudu table, Kudu master, Kudu table keys, all that good stuff. Now, I don't have Natiza running here, so I'm going to go to a cluster to show you what this all looks like. So in the cluster, now I'm up in a cluster. You can see CDH demo 20, 236, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll show you three pipelines um, that we use all the time here. So the first is very similar to the one I just showed you with a Wrangler transform in to take XML data from Natiza and parse it, put it into Kudu. So very simple, this is the bulk ingest. So you run this first. Second, we have incremental loading from Natiza. So after you've done your bulk load, you would run this pipeline on a scheduled basis, where basically it's tracking state. So there's an action at the front where you restore the state, you use inputs from that to drive the parameters of your Natiza query, so you only grab the latest data. And then at the bottom, we write back the state at the end. Here's where we write up to. So this can run once a minute or once an hour and grab that last bucket of data and write it out into Kudu. And then the last thing is now we've got all this data in Kudu. Well, let's filter out the missing locations. Let's do a group by. So we're grouping by the location and summing up the total purchases by location. So our output schema is the total purchases year to date for a given city, state, country. That then could be written back to Kudu as well as be written back to Natiza. One of the things that's interesting here is, let's say I want to look at the metadata and lineage around these things. And my internet.
that just stopped? I think they cut me off because I'm over time. Um, what happened? All right, well, let me show you over here. So basically, everything that you're doing, if we want to go back to, for example, my customer CSV file or my customer parquet. So let's see, I see this customer parquet. There's not a lot of usage, obviously, because we just created it. We can see its schema. We can see what programs it's accessed. We can look at its lineage and its audit log. So here we're looking at the customer parquet. It's got these two peers, the customer table and the customer errors. It was written to by this phase of a MapReduce job. Um, we can go and click on this and explore that job specifically. And it was read from this customer CSV file. So whenever you create the pipelines, whenever you do these wrangles, all this stuff is just tracked automatically. Um, all this stuff is available through the UIs, through REST APIs. It's also published to a Kafka queue. And so it integrates directly with like Cloudera Navigator. Um, Apache Atlas support is in our next release. And some of our large enterprises actually pipe all this metadata into their own data discovery engines. And so CDAP tracks all of it for you and then makes it very, very accessible so that if you don't want to do everything through this UI, you can integrate it into your existing kind of governance and, and management tool sets. So I'm already over time. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And uh, I'm going to stick around here after for any questions. And Cask also has a booth. And you can go get a better demo from a better engineer than me. Thank you. <laughs>